Uh, good evening, everyone. Man, that's pretty sad. You all sound like you don't want to be here. Good, good evening, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, welcome, and thank you all for so much for coming down this evening. Um, now we'll get official. Uh, this is a continuation of the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole. Let me give you the public testimony ground rules. We are here this evening to hear from you about the proposed budget and where you believe the city should focus its spending priorities to ensure that there is an opportunity for all that is here to, this evening to be heard. Certain ground rules have been established. I hate using the term ground rules, you know, this whole rule thing, but this is what the script says, so I don't want you to think that I'm imposing rules on you. Uh, I follow orders. Um, first, your testimony should be about the budget and proposed spending priorities. Copies of that are available on the table at the back of the room. All speakers must sign up in order to testify. So if you have not already signed up, please do so now by signing your name at the list at the same table at the back of the room. Your name will be called in the order of which you have signed up. You will have three minutes to speak in order to be fair because we have such a significant number of people who are interested in testifying tonight. We want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity. We have a timer, and when you hear the old-fashioned egg timer, um, when your three minutes are up, that timer will go off. And if you feel like you want to stop before the three minutes are up, it's okay. All right? <laughs> Uh, I would ask Ms. Lewis to please read the name of our first speaker. Our first speaker is Janine Matiski. And you know what? Why don't we just bring three up? Well, let's bring three up at a time. So. Janine Lutitsky, Kathleen Hall, and Tan Vu. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Janine Lutitsky, and I'm the executive director of Women Against Abuse and we appreciate the ongoing support of City Council. Women Against Abuse is the largest domestic violence service provider and advocacy organization here in Pennsylvania. We serve about 15,000 people each year, and we're funded through a number of line items, both government and private. Philadelphia's Office of Supportive Housing and Department of Human Services are integral in supporting the services of Women Against Abuse. Last year, our safe haven, the only one in Philadelphia for survivors of domestic violence, turned away an all-time high of nearly 9,000 requests for safe shelter. As you know, City Council prioritized funding for a new 100-bed safe haven, and we are really happy to announce that we're making steady progress on renovations on our new building and will open this spring. The new safe haven will double Philadelphia's capacity to shelter survivors. Additionally, thanks to the strategic thinking of the Office of Supportive Housing, we've established a domestic violence specialist within OSHA's central family intake. The DV specialist is able to meet with clients to triage their housing and safety needs and directly connect them to intake in our safe haven, as well as the emergency bed placements that are available through our domestic violence sister agencies. The installation of this staff person has created a more seamless and safer emergency housing response for survivors. Although we are extremely grateful for the additional funding made available, the 2.5 million that was allotted to the safe haven leaves a financial gap, as well as a gap in client services. Specifically, there's not enough funding to provide parallel on-site children's and behavioral health services that we are able to provide at our current safe haven. Almost done. Hey, no, I'm sorry. Both of these services are critical interventions for persons experiencing DV as they move forward from trauma, and filling this gap is fundamental to effectively addressing complex trauma. So we ask that you continue to remember victims of domestic violence in the budget, and particularly those who need emergency housing and life-saving legal protections. Together, we know that we can break the cycle of abuse and create safety for families and for our community. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for your good work. Now, hold on one second, please. Uh, 
Councilwoman Tasco. She recognizes Councilwoman Good Tasco. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming out. And thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. Are there any funds from the state that are available to you for um, increasing um, locations for families? There, there's little, state funding has been flat for so long, and only last year there was a very slight increase that helped to offset the federal sequestration cut. Mm -hmm. So right now, the state does support our current safe haven, mm -hmm. which they support a large chunk, and the city does too, but there's no additional funds. Thank you, thank you, thank you Councilwoman. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, one more question. Uh, I'm trying to. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Uh, chair recognizes Councilwoman Brown. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Councilwoman Tasco raised a question about state contribution. Speak in, uh, briefly and more about the work you're doing on behalf of children in that circumstance. So within. We have um, children's case management, so every family that comes to us, we have a case manager specifically for the children. So they literally make sure that they, their school is seamless, you know, okay. if they have to transfer to schools, they go and help create a safety plan because those kids are also in danger. They make sure that the children are getting trauma-informed behavioral health care, whether it be with us or within the community, and that their needs are addressed. We have many children who come to us and have, are not speaking because of the trauma that they've seen. And by working with them, by having behavioral health care on site, we're able to turn that around quickly. That's we're seeing that children are very resilient, but only if they can get these critical services. And so in our current shelter, we have them, but in the new safe haven, we won't because we have 2.5 million allotted and that's not enough. What about after school programming for the children? We, and that's part of what we do as well. We have after school programming at our current safe haven. We will not have that at the new safe haven because of the gap. Okay. All right. That's what I needed to know. And so with that then, um, any connectedness or support from the Philadelphia Foundation? Yes. You a do? lot of support. Okay. They've been a champion of this work. Okay. And, then. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, thank you. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Kathleen Hall. I'm a medical case manager at a federally qualified health center within West Philadelphia area. And I come speaking on behalf of a new program that we're trying to get started called New Beginnings. New Beginnings would be a nonprofit organization and we're looking to target teen pregnancy prevention. I've been in a nonprofit Field for over 25 years and the, what I experience in seeing teenagers in pregnancy as young as 12 years old are pregnant and as you know up to the age of 19 and I see what teen pregnancy can do to teenagers with lack of income for families, lack of housing, um, lack of support system and this program would target prevention of pregnancy by educating teenagers on pregnancy prevention counseling, health care, we can link them into health services, as well as education to encourage them to continue their education as well as preventing pregnancy. Um, the purpose of this would be to hope that the city council will look at a community after school educational program within the West Philadelphia area. And this would focus on educating teenagers in group and individual settings on prevention of not only pregnancy, but prevention of STD and HIV. Also, we would we hope that there, would, there are really no current programs within the West Philadelphia area that would service such a community of teenagers to help educate them on reasons why to delay sexual behaviors and to use birth control if they are sexually active. Um, the benefits of this program, not only would it be to prevent STD and HIV, also the benefit would be to partner with the Family Planning Council in their program called iMatter. And iMatter is a program that also speaks to teen pregnancy prevention. This program would also help to refer teenagers into health care as well as um, um, give them other options because we feel as though the more options they have, the better choices that they would make. 
Um, there are several buildings throughout West Philadelphia that I have noticed, such as the building at 60th and Haverford that are vacant. There's another one at 55th and uh, Media that is also vacant. And these buildings will also be a good place to have an educational center for teenagers after school or even before school. It would be like a place where teenagers could come and get information on prevention. Thank you. Are you Man, I hate the way it abruptly cut you off. Were, were you, were you, you done? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. It just sounded like you caught you oh. mid sentence. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, kind of. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next three speakers: Tan Vu, Farah Jimenez, and Julie Hawkins. Tan Vu, Farah Jimenez, and Julie Hawkins. Yeah, we're, you, you, my understanding is four individuals okay. yeah. working for Well, is did we call any of the names? Yeah. Did we, we call, that's Julie. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you want to come up together? Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Fine. Sure. So Julie Hawkins, Michael Norris, and Christina Rose. Let's just do the four. Yeah. And if, and, and if you have any information in support of your testimony, uh, you could just submit it for the record and we will include it in the docket. All right. Good evening. Good evening, Council President Clark and members of City Council. Thank you for the opportunity could, to speak with you this evening about could, the... Could you all just put a record, give your name uh, at the start my, of your testimony? No, just when you, oh, when you yeah, testify, yeah. just for the sure. stenographer. So. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Michael Norris. I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about the cultural sector's impact on our city and the need to restore funding for the Philadelphia Cultural Fund to its previous level of $3.2 million. Uh, I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance. The Cultural Alliance represents over 400 of the region's cultural organizations, and nearly three quarters of those organizations are here in Philadelphia. We are also proud to be one of the 273 Philadelphia Cultural Fund grantees. Today you will hear from Julie Hawkins, Board President of the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, Stephen Wittenberg, Board President of Spells Writing Lab, another cultural fund grantee, and Asia Kaiser, a Philadelphia teen who participates in arts programs around the city. Today we are celebrating Philadelphia Arts Advocacy Day. Arts supporters from across the city have signed our petition, taken to social media, and joined us here today, all to show their support for the Cultural Fund. The people who participated in this campaign hail from every district in the city and represent different backgrounds, ages, and socioeconomic statuses. The diversity of these advocates reflects the vast impact that our cultural organizations have on the people of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is home to a vibrant and celebrated cultural sector. The mile from City Hall to the Philadelphia Museum of Art is often lauded as the most artistic mile in the country. But it isn't just the famed Museum Mile that makes Philadelphia a world-class cultural destination. We have art galleries in Old City, jazz festivals in West Oak Lane, and public gardens in Strawberry Mansion. We are also home to organizations like Spell's Writing Lab that are stepping up and providing creative outlets for students with no access to arts education. All these programs and organizations have a major impact on the Philadelphia economy. The Philadelphia cultural sector has a total economic impact of $2.8 billion and generates 30,000 jobs, $766 million in household income for Philadelphia residents, and $119 million in tax revenue for the city. But all the vibrancy generated by our cultural assets is threatened by financial vulnerability. Almost half of the organizations we monitor are in the red. Our belief is that if our community wants the cultural sector to continue delivering these economic and social benefits, we need to invest in it. 
That's why we support public policies that provide cultural organizations with the resources they need and why we encourage City Council to restore the cultural fund to $3.2 million. In closing, I would like to read a statement from Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Chiara Alegria Hudes, who's a Philadelphia native and the niece of Councilwoman Canona Sanchez. As a teenager, Chiara joined Philadelphia Young Playwrights, another cultural fund grantee, where she wrote and produced her first play. Chiara writes that, quote, when I put pen to paper and wrote my play, I decided to articulate the city of Philadelphia as I had experienced it growing up in West Philly. Articulating my worldview, giving voice to a new side of things, changed my relationship with my world. I suddenly was an active shaper of my community, an intellectual, an entertainer, a truth teller. Young playwrights prepared me for a life in literature, a life of civic action, a life of activism, and a true democratic engagement with my community. One sentence. On behalf of the supporters in this room and across the city, I ask you to restore the cultural fund's budget so that all the residents of our city, especially young people like Kiara and Asia, can benefit from Philadelphia's rich and diverse cultural assets. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julie Hawkins, board president of the Philadelphia Cultural Fund. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here today. For the last month or so, you've seen a lot of tweets and posts about what Philly Arts do. You saw it happening live in the hallways just a few hours ago. You've also seen a lot of requests today to restore arts funding in Philadelphia. So I'm here tonight to tell you more about what Philly Arts do so that we can work together to restore that arts funding. What Philly Arts do for people and communities is documented in multiple research studies. The arts in Philadelphia promote individual growth, educational gains, economic development, community dialogue, and social cohesion. They animate spaces, celebrate our diverse heritage, provide pathways to opportunity, and support healing. What Philly Arts do is provide a great return on investment. One example is in after-school programs like Rock to the Future that provide safe and empowering environments for Philadelphia youth. At Rock to the Future, students receive individual music lessons, learn to read sheet music, compose their own songs, and play a range of instruments, and form their own rock bands. Rock to the Future does what Philly Arts do so well. It engages the whole person by tapping into and then building on what matters to them. What Philly Arts do is step up to the plate. Despite cuts in funding, organizations and artists maintain their support of classrooms, curriculum, teachers, and students in the Philadelphia School District. Groups like Musicopia, who had two wonderful musicians playing in the hallway earlier today, provide not just music instruction, but musical instruments to schools across the district and the region. Last year alone, Musicopia served more than 34,000 students. What Philly Arts do is wonderful, it's vital, but it needs your increased support in the city budget. When the recession hit, the Philadelphia Cultural Fund was cut by 42% from $3.2 million to $1.84 million. It's been flatlining ever since. Among the country's five most populated cities, Philadelphia has by far the lowest per capita local government investment in arts and culture. This is also true of cities whose populations are comparable to Philadelphia's and smaller cities whose cultural sectors, dare I say, are maybe not as vibrant and diverse as ours. We need you to restore arts funding in Philadelphia. What Philly Arts do is forge ahead, despite the obstacles. Even with sustained cuts in funding, the Cultural Fund has increased its access to Philadelphia's artists and cultural organizations. We redesigned our grant process to be more inclusive and more supportive of the diversity and range of our city's cultural assets and its people. These changes are working, and they need your support. What Philly Arts do deserves more investment from Philadelphia. An increase in the Cultural Fund will enable us to bring back youth arts enrichment grants. They make investments in arts education that serve K-12 students in the school district. Thank you for the chance to speak today, for the work that you do on behalf of all Philadelphians, and for considering the city's investment in what Philly Arts do. Restore arts funding. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Steve Wittenberg, 
the president of Spells Writing Lab, a small but growing nonprofit located in Council President Clark's 5th District in North Philadelphia on the campus of the Village of Arts and Humanities. Our mission is to instill the, instill the love of creative writing in Philadelphia school-age children through fun and imaginative writing programs, which includes an after-school writing club, workshops, and a six-week summer writing camp, all free programs. Over our four-year history, we estimate that we've engaged over 4,000 students in schools and in over 70 community programs, such as the Philadelphia Science Festival and Mayor Nutter's Philly Goes to College program. 80 to 90 percent of our students are considered underprivileged. We've achieved success on a meager $40,000 per year budget. All other accomplishments come by way of pro bono services, local, co local college interns, and volunteerism. Over the next few years, we aim to make a significant impact on Philadelphia's youth. With increased funding, we will be able to renovate a bladed building, which will double our capacity. We can help local schools create after-school writing programs. We can expand to other areas of the city. This month, we met with Drexel University to begin discussions on a collaboration to bring spells to West Philadelphia as part of the President's Promise Zone program. Our success depends on an influx of grant money from endowments like the Philadelphia Cultural Fund. Last month, we received a modest but meaningful grant from the fund, which unfortunately decreased almost 50 percent from prior years. The current grant will help us, but is not nearly enough. We've heard our challenges echoed by other organizations with whom we collaborate. As the Director of Legacy and Philanthropy S Solutions at SEI, I'm exposed to the same budget issues of many meaningful organizations throughout the region. We understand the constraints of the city's budget, but ask that you strongly consider increasing the Philadelphia Cultural Fund's allotment in future years. Writing is a key to success, both in school and future endeavors. In this struggling educational climate, spells is an outlet to improve children's writing. I invite you to our lab, our writing lab, where you will see the impact small organizations can make. You'll see students like Vanessa and Amir experimenting with words in a safe and welcoming space, reaching for books and computers to expand the world through stories and ideas. And you'll see those same students create their own works and take that skill and love of writing home with them. The proof of our success is, in, is, in, is our impact on the students. In closing, I leave you with the musings of Trinity, age 12, who wrote the following at a Martin Luther King Jr. workshop called I Have a Dream. I have a dream. I have a dream that there will be no more writer's block because right now I have writer's block. <laughs> I, have a, I have a dream that one day I'll know what to say and what I'm talking about. I have a dream that one day I won't have writer's block because I've always had lots of things on my mind but never quite had time to sort them out. I have a dream. I have a dream that my mind will one day sort out all my thoughts and make me a better writer. I have a dream that one day I'd eat octopus with my best friend Micaiah because we want to eat some. I have a dream that one day I'd stop rambling about random things because then people will listen. I want to be the voice of the voiceless. This is my hope. This will be the day when I move on to seventh grade. And when this happens, I'll be the best writer in my school and take on writing assignments anybody, anyone gives me. I have a dream. We at Spells have a dream too. Without the assistance of organizations like the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, we will not be able to fulfill the dreams of Trinity and students like her who strive to embrace and explore new forms of self-expression. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Asia Kaiser, and I'm a sophomore at J.R. Masterman. I'm also on the Teen Council for STAMP, um, the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance program, which gives Philadelphia teens free access to museums across the city. I love having access to so many cultural opportunities in the city with my stamp pass. When I was younger, my mom would take me to museums all the time, and I have loved having the opportunity to branch out on my own and explore my own interests. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, and I love the city because of its beautiful arts, great cultural diversity, and historic importance. I believe that Philadelphia's rich talent in the arts is part of what makes it the unique city it is. I'm so grateful that there are so many ways for me to see art and experience culture in Philadelphia, and also that there are so many organizations that give me opportunities to participate in the arts. One organization I'm especially close to is Musicopia, a Philadelphia Cultural Fund grantee organization. I play the cello in their orchestra, and I'm very passionate about what I do. I love music and the experience of playing in an orchestra with fellow musicians. I believe that playing an instrument is a beautiful form of self-expression and freedom 
and an opportunity that every student in Philadelphia should be able to experience. I was Principal Charles in Philadelphia Middle School All City, and I have been a member of the high school All City Orchestra for two years. And I'm very proud of my accomplishments, which have been made possible by these type of organizations across the city. I think one way to make Philadelphia an even more amazing city is by giving opportunities for all children to explore the arts, whether it's in school, on their own, or through one of the many amazing cultural institutions in Philadelphia, like the Philadelphia Cultural Fund Grantee Organizations. Thank you. Thank you. A pity who has to follow you in this testimony. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Please. Thank you. The next three witnesses, um, Beth McConnell, Judith Robinson, and Lin Linda Richardson. Beth McConnell, Judith Robinson, and Linda Richardson. <clears throat> Good evening. I have some longer written testimony. I'll summarize. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Beth McConnell, Policy Director at the Philadelphia Association of CDCs. Um, as you all know, Congress has slashed funding that Philadelphia receives for affordable housing and community development by more than 40 million since 2002, and another cut of 740,000 is projected for our CDBG allocation next year. These cuts have devastating impacts on Philadelphia's low-income residents and distressed neighborhoods. In fact, we only have about 38 units of affordable housing for every 100 households that are extremely low income. Waiting lists for housing repair programs are years long, and too many of our neighborhood commercial quarters are plagued with vacancies, poor property conditions, and litter. We want to applaud Council and the administration for your leadership in creating and expanding both the CDC tax credit program and the Philadelphia Housing Trust Fund. Uh, but the city's annual general fund outlay is inadequate to meet the enormous needs. Just a little over three million is proposed for next year, and that's down from five and a half million in FY07. So we want to urge that you work with the administration to pass legislation to increase funding for the Housing Trust Fund this spring by increasing the mortgage and deed recording fee by five dollars. That could provide up to 750,000 per year to help restore some of the cuts to affordable housing development and preservation. We also urge Council to work with the administration to provide a million in new general fund dollars for two key commercial corridor programs, which would allow the Commerce Department to expand the programs to as many as 12 corridors. Um, our neighborhood commercial corridors are the economic veins of our city, and research shows that when they're in good condition, they increase home values by 36 percent, but the opposite is true when they're in bad condition. But of the more than 60 quarters throughout our city, fewer than 18 actually received support from the targeted quarter management program and the quarter cleaning grants, all of which are funded by CDBG funds. And some distressed quarters, particularly in, in the Northwest, are not eligible to receive funding from these programs because of federal program restrictions. So uh, providing some general fund dollars would give commerce the flexibility to direct resources to quarters that are not CDBG eligible, but really still in need of management and cleaning. We also urge Council to support Mayor Nutter's request for $500,000 from the general fund as part of a larger funding strategy for the land bank. Once fully implemented, the land bank will, of course, transform the way we get vacant properties back into productive reuse, generating property tax revenue that our schools and cities need. Uh, in closing, more than 42 percent or more than $20 million of Philadelphia's CDBG allocation will be spent on operational costs for the city in FY15. And those are dollars that are not then available to community organizations on the ground that provide critical services, support, and economic development activity in our neighborhoods. Uh, the work that city staff does with those funds is very important, uh, but it's time for the general fund to replace some of those dollars. At a time when some parts of the city are seeing new private investment and growth, it's really our responsibility to invest public dollars in equitable development strategies to benefit neighborhoods and residents that would otherwise be left behind. Thank you very much for allowing us to provide testimony. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, hold on. Chair recognizes Councilman Jones. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I, I just want to thank you for your testimony. We just engaged in a dialogue with the Office of Housing and Community Development, the Redevelopment Authority, and they're talking about the continued cut uh, from CDBG dollars, and I wanted to task them uh, to look in non-conventional ways to figure it out, how to get affordable housing, how to get affordable rental, and one of the proposals uh, Council President Clark did is to uh, look outside the box to figure out how we can create a, 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 a total of about 3,000 units uh, within affordable housing. So I don't know if you had an opportunity to check that out, but we would love to collaborate with you on figuring it out. Um, so um, I, ju I just wanted to put that out there and, and make that offer. Great. Absolutely. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Linda Waters Richardson, and I serve as the president of the Uptown Entertainment and Development Corporation. My organization is the owner of the historic Uptown Theater. Our mission is to provide neighborhood stabilization through programs such as planning. We are a registered community organization. Our youth programs, art and culture, and economic development. We are currently convening many art and cultural groups that provide services to the broader community, but whose mission is to promote and perpetuate African American culture. If fully operational, our combined operating budgets would have an impact of 189 jobs, and our construction capital budget would represent 225 jobs. Our organizations are in neighborhoods that are low income, and many are doing historic preservation while providing vital services to underserved residents. While our missions are culture and nature, we do not have a one-and-done approach to tourism. Many of us visiting historic sites visit in elementary school, or when we have children take them, or when we are lucky, like myself, have grandchildren take them. Our organizations and sites provide ongoing services to ensure community enhancement and many of us are models of the National Historic Trust emerging sites that are looking at a broad range of approach to historic preservation. The first African American Historic Preservation Trail that we have convened promotes health and wellness through biking, walking, and adding cultural enrichment, which was launched in February of 2013. The pilot project was supported by the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. There are over 400 African American historic sites documented. However, many of those sites no longer exist, and those that do are in need of capital and operating support. Many of those sites in our network promote 19th and 20th century icons, such as the Paul Robeson House in West Philadelphia, the John Coltrane House in North Philadelphia, Tinley Temple in South Philadelphia, and of course the Uptown Theater. I can talk a little bit about the trail, um, so I'm going to truncate my um, presentation, but the trail is organized in historic areas that um, promote the Philadelphia 7th Ward, the echoes of the Great Migration, music as an expression of culture, religious institutions as community builders, and the Underground Railroad to Civil Rights Pathways to Freedom. I'm just going to say we want to support, and we are asking for support for funding of culture, as well as expanding the general fund for support of the neighborhood cultural corridors, the cultural cleaning grants, and um, I have a list of those groups that I represent and um, in my testimony. So I want to thank you um, for your support. Thank you so much. The next 
three witnesses, Frank McGonigan, Charles Lanier, and Amy Dougherty. start yeah good evening hi uh, good evening uh, thank you for the opportunity I'm Frank Monahan executive director Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia uh, we work to transform lives we build and repair homes in Philadelphia for people who earn between 30 and 60 percent of the median income they also the families buy the house from us at a zero interest mortgage after they do 350 hours of sweat equity uh, Tomorrow we will be de dedicating our 174th house, actually in Council President Clark's district, and we're very proud of that. We also restore and preserve existing home for low-income homeowners by providing repairs, needed modifications, and weatherization. We are able to do this through two robust habitat repair programs that work in many neighborhoods throughout the city. Habitat is able to assist 75 to 100 homeowners and their families each year through these preservation programs. We've found that if the roof goes in four years, the home becomes vacant. So we try to catch it early on. Habitat is strategically building and preserving communities throughout the city. We leverage every dollar we spend to provide $4.50 worth of critical services, yet we are bound by our limited financial resources. Federal and state funding for community development and affordable housing has been drastically cut over the last few years. At Habitat, we very much appreciate that the city, and specifically OHCD, is facing nearly $40 million in budget cuts from the federal government. We understand that this has forced city agencies to make some extremely difficult decisions about how to prioritize the use of CDBG and other funds. While funding has decreased, the need is not. The National Low Income Housing Coalition estimates that Philadelphia has only 38 affordable units for every 100 households. We need approximately 60,000 more units to meet the need of residents who live at or below 30 percent of AMI. We understand these cuts hurt all agencies that are working to preserve, restore, and build safe and affordable homes for hundreds of thousands of low-income residents in Philadelphia. However, locally generated funds have also been inadequate in comparison to the extreme needs. The city's general fund contribution to affordable homes and community economic development is minimal at just $3 million per year. Of this, $2.3 million from the city's general fund allocated for vacant land management is essential, but we also need more funding that goes to preserve affordable homes and Philadelphia traditional housing stock. Specifically, we urge the Nutter administration to work with city council to introduce and pass legislation to increase funding to the Housing Trust Fund by raising the mortgage deed and recording fees by $5, which could raise an additional $750,000 per year. We also ensure adequate funding for the land bank so that organizations like Habitat are able to acquire and aggregate vacant land to seize and capitalize on all opportunities for more affordable housing. Mayor Nutter has proposed using $500,000 in general fund dollars towards the land bank's total budget. It is critical to ensure that whatever local sources of revenue are identified, that funding is adequate to ensure the land bank works. Consider utilizing some larger proportion of CDBG funding for housing preservation for low-income homeowners. According to the Year 40 Preliminary Comp Plan, more than 42 percent of Philadelphia CDBG allocations will be spent on operational costs. This is a significant amount totaling more than $20 million. This puts a significant drain on the potential funding for the essential community organizations that provide critical services. Habitat also supports, I'm just about done, the city's DCED application for $300,000 in state grant funds for residential and commercial facade improvements as a way to leverage the exciting opportunities of the Promise Zone designation in Mantua, as well as the Choice Neighborhoods Federal Grant applications in North, North, eastern North Philadelphia. Thank you very much for everything that you do. Thank you for your Thank testimony, you. sir. Councilwoman? Councilwoman, did you? Did you? You okay? Okay. Thank you. Am I next? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I also have my testimony to uh, distribute. Good evening. 
Evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present testimony on behalf of the Neighborhood Advisory Committees and Neighborhood Action Centers hereafter called NACS. My name is Charles Lanier, and I am the board president of the Strawberry Mansion Neighborhood Action Center, as well as the interim executive director of the Hunting Park Neighborhood Advisory Committee. I have chosen as my, I have chosen as my theme the choice, the issue of community survival in Philadelphia. I've made this choice as a theme because it has become a matter of survival for all of the committed and dedicated NAC board members, staff, volunteers that believe in the mission of promoting the general development welfare and well-being of all people residing or established uh, in the communities of the city of Philadelphia, utilizing established and innovative methods of developing the community, focusing primarily on, but not limited to, the areas of housing, education, economic development, social welfare, neighborhood beautification and recreation without displacing residents. I emphasize innovative methods because as NACs, we are the most innovative and compassionate group of people representing the population of people we serve every day, the majority of who are low to moderate income fam individuals and families who may not have necessary resources to make a difference in their lives. As NACs, we make that difference. We work long hours. We are the ambassadors of our communities. We provide services that allow, that allow our communities to have access to programs, events, and community activities and, and in many instances, we are the voice of the community. In many of our communities, through the use of the community computer labs, many of the communities would be facing severe barriers to the te technological information highway. In addition to being advocates between the city and the community, community organizers and information resource centers, we provide services and programs that consist of and not limited to basic systems repair, weatherization, energy conservation, energy programs, lighting crisis, use of light cap, housing counseling, heater repair, Emergency food centers and technology centers. We provide community service briefings. We are also registered community organizations that inform our communities about zoning issues. And we organize black captain, captains, conduct vacant property surveys, and have community appreciation days, providing free food, fun, information, entertainment to show our appreciation for the continued support of our residents. Over the years, NACs have consistently been reduced, and the service areas boundaries have consistently increased. And at the same time, the funding levels for NACs have consistently been reduced. We have reduced staffing levels that are underpaid, overworked, and we are competing for funding for program survival, such as computer labs, jobs for adults and youth, health services, and our seniors. Uh, we are called upon to support and promote major city events, city council, RDA, PATC, a host of other organ uh, organizations and services that are related to the city of Philadelphia. Our major funding source is the Office of Housing and Community Development, which, for which we are very grateful. Please, we are surviving, but the struggle is getting harder, and the lack of resources makes our survival a matter of choices. But what services do we have to cut this year? Please restore our funding levels and increase the amount of funding dollars needed so that we don't have to make those two choices. Recommendation proposal. We as NACs are required by the HUD or OECD contract to cut, conduct and produce vacant property surveys. We are required to convene community meetings as a uh, RSTL to inform community of zoning requests and services. Uh, we're required to uh, support and promote community economic development projects and so forth. And whereas uh, our, our budgets for, have consistently decreased over the last four years, please consider the following recommendation proposals. In accordance with the proposal to increase revenues to the Housing Trust Fund by an estimated $750,000 per year by raising the mortgage deed and recording fees by just $5, in addition to the allocated funds provided to the NACs, please consider increasing the mortgage deed and recording fees by an additional $5, total $10 to provide an estimated $750,000 per year to provide adequate funding for NACs. Thank you very much for allowing me to present but, my testimony. Thank you, sir. Ms. Starker. Um, Chair Reconnell, I'm sorry. Chair Reconnell, is Councilman Jones. I get a question for you. <laughs> You're in a hurry to get out of that seat. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you, your testimony was almost as fast as I think Chip Kelly's would have been. Uh, but there was, there was some really good facts, and I just wanted to clarify to make sure. How many necks are in the city of Philadelphia now? Right now, I believe there are 19. Uh, even between 19 and 20, I'm not sure. But it's been at, at the high for NACs has been like 43. And that was 43. years ago. 
many years ago. But now that is almost reduced by half, if not more. And you mentioned that even though the numbers have been reduced, the areas they service are larger? Yes. For example, uh, in Survey Mansion, because of the, our service area has almost doubled because of a redu reduction in the number of Macs in our community. We, there was South Lehigh that represented uh, North Philadelphia, uh, but there's long, no longer North Le uh, Lehigh Mac. So we have taken over the boundaries for North Lehigh. And you rattled off a whole litany of services that you provide. <laughs> Um, and and if, if you could just hit the top three or four? Uh, the top three or four. Uh, we, we provide the housing counseling services. We provide energy court. We are, we are also funded as a uh, neighborhood uh, energy center as well. Uh, we provide, uh, let's see, three or four. Uh, we I'll work read with, the testimony. It's okay, sorry. just read the testimony. Uh, it's all uh, included. And, <laughs> and then finally, you came up with some creative ideas about how to raise money yes. in light of the federal cuts. Could you repeat some of them in a slower mode? Sure. Thank you very much stuff. for allowing me to do that. Uh, whereas NACs are required by the OAC contract to conduct and produce vacant property surveys, and whereas NACs are required to convene community meetings as an RCO to inform the community of a zoning request variance reports presented to the zoning board, and whereas NACs are required by the zoning board to attend and or to provide a letter supporting or not supporting the zoning request of variance, and whereas NACs are required to support and promote community economic development projects, and we are re required to reach out to the business community in our commercial corridors and support the transformation of our neighborhood centers, and as well as provide residents, businesses, and developers with assistance with the mortgage and deed transfer process required for vacant properties in our community, and of course being underfunded for the last four years. Uh, in accordance with the proposal to increase revenues to the Housing Trust Fund by an estimated $750,000 per year by raising the mortgage deed and recording fees by just $5. <laughs> our proposal is, in addition to the allocated funds provided to the NACs, please consider increasing the mortgage deed and recording fees by an additional $5 which would be a total of $10 to provide an estimated $750 per year to provide adequate funding for NACs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, President Clark, Clark and City Council. Thank you so much for um, letting me testify testified today. I'm here with Terry Gillen, who needs no introduction. Terry was a, a former board member of the Friends of the Free Library. Anyway, I'm here this evening with some good news. Um, we can get six-day libraries back again after five years. Um, Mayor Nutter has put a restoration of the Free Library's budget of 2.5 million in his proposed budget, and I'm here to ask all of you to um, ratify that so that we can have six-day libraries everywhere, in every neighborhood in the city. Um, just take you back down memory lane to the fall of 2008, the FY09 budget of the Free Library was 40 million, and then of course it was cut by 20% or 8 million, um, and then we've incrementally gone up, 32 million, 33 million, 35 million this year so that 10 branches can be open six days a week, so just with two and a half million more, we can get every library in the city open six days a week. And we all love libraries, and we know why they're important. Um, we need libraries for everybody in every neighborhood, for working families who come home late, can't get to the library except for a Saturday, for children and youth who are now traveling sometimes half an hour to get to and from school, um, need to get to their libraries on Saturday for homework, for computers, for the 50% of Philadelphians who do not have home computers and need to apply for a job or do some job training or learn how to write a resume, or for those folks who were, who were signing up for the Affordable Care Act um, and needed health insurance, they went to their local library. So I'm just asking you, I'm just here to ask you to please vote yes for six-day libraries throughout the city of Philadelphia by ratifying 2.5 million for the Free Library of Philadelphia's general fund. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. The next witness, three witnesses, Cornelia Swinson, Derek Frerez, and Larry Holman, and Jennifer Hawk. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, President Clark and members of City Council. Um, my name is Cornelia Swinson, and I'm the Executive Director of G-Town Restoration uh, CDC, which is located on Germantown Avenue in the heart of Germantown and Shelton Business District. Um, we are a nonprofit, of course, and we serve the central Germantown section of Northwest Philadelphia. We were designated as a Neighborhood Advisory Committee, a NAC, in 2012. We're funded by the Office of Housing and Community Development to serve the Northwest. Um, we, were, we are one of what used to be two NACs designated. There was the Mount Erie NAC as well as uh, the Germantown NAC, and we are the newest uh, NAC in Germantown. Um, we incorporate five core objectives into our delivery of services. Uh, Charles Lanier spoke primarily about them when he presented his testimony, and that's promoting sustainability creating employment opportunities, enhancing neighborhood safety, and providing decent affordable housing, and working in partnership with local stakeholders to foster community revitalization. We were, as I mentioned earlier, designated as a NAC in 2012, and since then we've accomplished the following, and this is just a summary. Uh, we've served 2,600 residents, Germantown residents, by providing on-site linkage and referral services, such as mortgage, uh, counseling, house uh, assistance, housing, basic systems repair, repair, first-time home buyers, credit assistance, landlord, tenant issues, uh, clean carters, land use issues, education and employment uh, assistance, to name a few. Uh, we've also been very um, forward-thinking in developing policies uh, to support the NAC infrastructure, including a community-driven election process, which means that our board, our advisory board, is elected by the residents that live in the community and not our organization. We've also developed zoning procedures. We were granted registered community organization status by the City of Philadelphia Planning Commission and assisted in convening what is called the Germantown RCO Collaborative Group, which hosts public community stakeholder meetings to discuss pr proposed zoning matters. We have, at this time, 12 RCOs in Germantown, and uh, that really impacts on the ability to give a consistent community public meeting a sense of direction, and so we formed this group to help us to meet that goal. Thus far, the Germantown RCO Collaborative Group, we've developed tools to assist and enhance all our RCOs, and this is a critical community service that they provide as volunteers. Since we've been designated as an RCO, we've worked to ensure that there was inclusion of resident voices in at least 24 zoning variances uh, matters in our neighborhoods. Um, and that's in just in the last year. Um, we also have worked very closely with Councilman Bass to um, reconvene and reinvigorate the Germantown Special Services District, which provides needed service in the community. We also worked very hard to galvanize a collaborative effort in Germantown to clean it up working with the Philly Spring Cleanup uh, program the City of Philadelphia presents every year. Uh, we've assisted businesses to open up, four to be exact, in, um, in the Germantown section in the last year. And um, we, have, we, we believe that um, as an organization that is clearly enmeshed in the community, what we provide is important. And last, I want to let you know that Germantown is growing. There's a lot of uh, change in Germantown. We see business opportunities in Germantown. Yes, we have developers investing in Germantown. And yes, the revitalization of the Special Services District couldn't come at a better time. 
Yet we know that the concept of equitable development to ensure that continued investment in the growth of Germantown is racially and economically inclusive, that we must champion it. The efforts of the G-Town NAC will help to make sure that everyone is included. I want to thank you for considering a special request, and that is to support the allocation um, to increase OECD funding to specifically fund NACs for the great work they provide in marginalized neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita Smith. I have some testimony turning. Thank you. My name is Derek Ferris, and I'm here today representing the Philadelphia Parks Alliance. I also serve on the boards of several park groups, including the Friends of Rittenhouse Square, the Fettler Square Improvement Association, and the Friends of Schuylkill River Park. On these groups, I and others work in strong partnership with the Department of Parks and Recreation, Commissioner D. Berardinas, and Deputy Commissioners Lewis, Fawcett, and Folk to help improve and maintain the parks I mentioned. The Parks Alliance commends the Parks and Recreation leadership for their tremendous efforts, stretching every cent they have to its maximum, leveraging alternative funding streams, and partnering with the community to creatively maintain and improve their buildings and parkland to the best degree possible with the resources currently available. Despite their model efforts, Parks and Recreation is one of the most underfunded departments in the city, and the 10,000 plus acres of land that they oversee reflects these funding insufficiencies. While the average budget for all the city departments combined has substantially increased over the past decades, the budget for Parks and Recre Recreation has not. Philadelphia spends just $46 per resident on parks. San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, and even Cincinnati spend five times that. And Pittsburgh spends more than double. We are among the lowest of major U.S. cities in dollar spending per resident on parks and on dollar spending per acre on parks. We commend this body for increasing the Parks and Recreation budget by $2.675 million for FY 2013. Even with this increase, we are still $5 billion short of a $9 billion increase promised past and then taken away from Parks and Recreation for FY 2009. This was to be a permanent funding stream for Parks and Recreation coming from a hike in parking taxes that occurred for FY 2009 and is still in place. These monies are currently being collected, but they are not going to Parks and Recreation Centers. As a result of this broken promise, since FY 2009, the Department of Parks and Recreation has lost over $50 million it would have received if the dedicated funding stream passed for FY 2009 had been directed to Parks and Recreation as promised. Unfortunately, underfunding our parks is not a new problem in Philadelphia. Since the year 2000, Parks and Recreation has lost 160 staff members because of chronic underfunding. Recreation facilities have been understaffed, and in 2013, 15 recreation, recreation centers had no staff members at all to offer programming, and 39 recreation centers had just one. If this one staff member is sick, kids lose a safe place to go in the summer, on the weekends, and after school. We know that Philadelphia's parks and recreation centers are the places where our city's children go after school to do their homework and play until their parents finish work, to be outside on a spring day, and have summer experiences in our camps and pools. We also know that parks are more than nice places to visit. They are intimately tied to the city's economic development. People want to live where well-maintained green spaces increase the value and desirability of their neighborhoods. And we know these spaces, when lively and well-programmed, decrease crime in adjacent areas. For FY 2009, the mayor and city council recognized the chronic underfunding of, of parks and recreation and approved a budget increase of $9 million. All of these promised funds were taken away for FY 2009 as a result of the city's and our country's wider economic turmoil. For FY 2003, this body and the mayor passed a much needed $2.675 million increase to the parks and recreation budget that has helped bring on more skilled trades workers to fix our roofs, ensure electric and plumbing systems work, and much more. This year, the mayor has proposed an increase to the parks and recreation budget of just $500,000 to add programming staff. On behalf of the parks with which I am associated, the Philadelphia Parks Alliance and citizens and parks across the city, I call on City Council and Mayor Nutter to restore the remaining $5 million promised to Parks and Recreation five years ago. This will take us back to the budget passed by City Council for FY 2009 and help us start to provide the quality of parks our city and its citizens deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. I believe I'm going out of turn here. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Jennifer Hawk. I'm the executive director of the Chestnut Hill Historical Society. And um, I believe I already submitted uh, copies of our written testimony to the gentleman at the door. Uh, we're here today to um, especially highlight uh, the historic firehouse, um, particularly the one in Chestnut Hill. But those across the city and the needs um, of those houses. 
um, that house um, our fire personnel um, across the city and what they deserve, as well as for um, your particular interest in pr preserving our historic firehouse located in Chestnut Hill. Um, and in, especially in their preservation, but also in the capital budget of purchases of new fire equipment and that the purchase of those fire equipment is uh, appropriate both to the size of the historic firehouse, but more importantly, to meet the particular needs of the community. Um, the trucks that are already deployed to our area uh, already have a challenge in getting around our small streets. Larger trucks which are being proposed would have an even greater challenge of getting around our small streets. Not only will it not fit into the historic firehouse, one that was designed by John T. Windrum in 1984 as part of a set, the police station is now gone. And one of the most significant Richardsonian Romanesque architectural features within the city and also one of the few remaining Windrum designed. And this was the height of the era of when the city um, really designed these magnificent buildings to highlight uh, municipal services. Uh, so not only would larger trucks put that building at risk and in any way to have to uh, alter its facade in order to fit them, but it also really would put smaller streets at risk, small streets such as Carol Lane, where the truck can barely get down it now. Um, Benazette, Navajo, Shawnee, just to name a few. And I think this is probably an issue that's not only just Chestnut Hill. We're an historic city and we're a city made up of small streets. And um, there are custom designed trucks that can be built, but they need to be built in, in purchase. We're also concerned about the serious deteriorating conditions of the firehouse in Chestnut Hill. And understand that this Chestnut Hill is not alone in that. Uh, specifically, physically for the building is there's serious concern about the roof that um, critically needs to be repaired um, before the damage gets so far along that it cannot be repaired. Um, and we happen to know that to do this um, in a historically significant way would be 200, 300,000. And one more last thing is the conditions, if people don't know, is that the conditions within the firehouses themselves. Our firefighters are sleeping on cots that have to be 50 years old with mattresses that are one inch thin and pillows that are just absolutely deplorable, you know, unpainted buildings, water on the walls. Um, you know, these are the people that we expect to go out and save our lives in a very physical, hazardous, um, potentially life-saving, life-threatening conditions. And they have really poor kitchens and really poor, um, uh, physical conditions, and w I think we want them to be the most well-rested, well-fed of our personnel, and I think that they deserve that, and, um, but we are particularly interested in our historic places in Chestnut Hill. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Sir. Hello, my name is Larry Holman. Uh, I'm a veteran and I'm representing the Point Man Soldiers Heart Ministry here today. Uh, President Clark and members of City Council, it's a, uh, an opportunity to be with you and I appreciate that. Uh, President Clark, I want to uh, express my appreciation to you for filling the vacancy of the uh, Director of the Veterans Advisory Commission. Uh, with uh, Scott Brown, uh, I met him several times, very impressed with him. Thank you. And uh, I understand that he will also be performing the duties of the County Director of Veterans Affairs as, as they are performed in other counties uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, we ha I haven't had uh, access to that part of the budget which affects the, the veterans operation in the city. But I just wanted to put some questions in the record uh, so that at some point uh, the, uh, the answers to these questions can be made public or accessible to veterans. Uh, what role does the uh, uh, Philadelphia Veterans Advisory Commission play in developing the budget for that office? Uh, will that part of city council uh, budget 
uh, be made available to any veteran in Philadelphia that wants to see it. And how can a veteran get a copy or access it online? Uh, we want to know also by looking at that budget if we can determine how the Philadelphia Veterans Advisory Commission is organized and can we find out if the commissioners uh, uh, that constitute the Veterans Advisory Commission each have distinct roles and responsibilities and uh, what kind of accountability goes along with that. Uh, if the office had a separate revenue stream, would it be able to expand its budget, its staffing, and its services to veterans? With 88,000 veterans in Philadelphia, veterans programs are sure to bring a return on investment because most benefits come through the federal government to the veteran who then uses that uh, uh, to, to help the economy of Philadelphia. Some of the programs that I think would be appropriate uh, for that office to get involved with would be uh, incarcerated veterans programs for veterans and their families, uh, <coughs> claims processing for uh, veterans and their survivors, expediting interactions uh, between veterans and the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs and the State Department of Military and Veterans Affairs and other providers of services to veterans. And also to maintain a gr Veterans Graves Registry uh, in Philadelphia and ensure that all veterans in Philadelphia get an appropriate uh, funeral and burial honors when they pass. I uh, want to make sure that uh, the folks at the Veterans Advisory Commission are able to attend meetings of the Pennsylvania State Veterans Commission and the Pennsylvania War Veterans Commission in Harrisburg and Fort Indian Town Gap. So we want to make sure that there is funding available to cover that kind of transportation cost. And we know that the more aggressive and outreach and claims processing program we have, the more federal VA dollars will be getting spent in Philadelphia. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I appreciate you. Thank your you so much help. for your testimony. Um, if, do you have those questions in writing? I'll be happy to submit them later. I'll, I'll write yeah. them up for you yeah, and get, and get them, them, to, them in. To uh, Will Carter or get them directly to Scott, and we'll make sure you get responses. And, um, you know about the May 21st date for the Veterans Fair? Yes. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, we actually have, I understand we're going to have a somewhat of a celebrity uh, at that particular event. Um, a, a good friend of ours, a former congressman, is going to be there. I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I think you could figure out who that is. Uh, has a TV show on MSNBC, and I'm not going <laughs> to say anything else. But we'll have uh, some, some, really, some really good people there. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much, sir. How are you doing, Councilman? Um, thank How you for you? having this public testimony um, to everyone in the city council. Um, I'm here today just, to just basically- state, state your name. Oh, my name is Orlando Acosta. I'm right. sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I'm basically here because um, I'm here to basically talk about the um, truancy issue of what's going on with a lot of families around the district. Now, the district basically has a policy at 1.5 where a lot of families, if they don't live within that 1.5 radius, they can either get bus service or, or transportation service. Now, what I'm systematically trying to work on um, is trying to find out resources and ways that to help these families be able to get the services they need as far as transportation because what the district is not doing is they're, they're just putting truancy um, officers um, on people's door without finding out the fundamental reasons why their, their children might be, be truant. Now there's a lot of different reasons why you, know, you have a truancy issue 
But what, I, what I'm systematically always saying to the district is, before you go back and, and put someone under truancy, you have to fundamentally find out the reason why. And this is what they're not doing. And what, what you know, myself, I mean, I just got um, bus service today for my son, which I'm, you know, gratefully aware, happy of, but it took me three, four months to navigate this whole situation and process. And I mean, I had to go through hell to, you know, do all that because I kept giving them information on things. They kept trying to ignore it and not pay attention to it. So finally today, you know, um, through the casework I was working with, we finally broke through and they finally agreed to, to give them bus service. But the real, the real reason is that they need to find out systematically and with city council, I would like to work together to find out, to find, give resources to other parents that's having that issue because systematically there is a lot of families that's going to the district telling them the re, you know, that they're having hardships or whatever else. Now, um, on the 5th or the 7th when the next testimony in public hearing, I would like to bring other family members that down here as far as, you know, community uh, individuals to, to give you public testimony of what difficult issues that they're, that they're going through. And what I'm also finding out is that a lot of families are having issues of the minute that they, they, that they say something publicly, that they're that you know they show up on the door and really try to systematically give give the families hard ways to go because they they've said something. So the fundamental reason is that I really want to give ways that families can g get over these hurdles because it, it it shouldn't take anyone four to five months to to systematically just get something that children need, which is services or bus service or trans transportation. Now, I understand that the state basically runs the majority of the district, but, the, but it's, it should be ways that we can find here within the city that we can work together to find out whether it's carpooling or companies that or accepted to give some aspect of ways that we can work together either with any transportation service to get these children to school because if a situation is transportation and that's the only reason that they're not getting to school on time, it's not academic problems or anything like that, why should you have a truancy office hounding you or, or giving you issue because you, you have a financial reason that you can't get a child to school. It took us, it's $100, 100 to 150 maybe $200 to go back and forth for one month. So you have low income families that right now can't afford that. Some of the families don't even have heat, food, or anything else. So before you have a truancy officer on the door, you need to find out the reason why, well, not not city council, but I'm talking about the district itself. Right. So, you know, I, I'm willing to really work with um, city council to find out other resources to do that because it, it's just real frustrating to see the stress that families are going through about just getting their children to school. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much for your testimony. And we'll have. Um, School district testimony first of, I think right. May fifth. May fifth. We'll talk right. to them. Thank you so much for your testimony, um, Ms. Lewis. There are no more witnesses this evening, sir. With that, I want to thank you and thank the council members very much for being present. Um, the committee will stand in recess until Wednesday, April thirtieth, at six p.m in which time we have a neighborhood budget hearing at West Oak Lane Charter School located at 7115 Stenton Avenue, and that will be hosted by Councilwoman Marion Tasco. Thank you.